televidente na di nos TV nos ta kinana directamente for di Amsterdam kaminda nos ta den VIP room kaminda mas kirate princess ta melote pasina eta be 13 su palabra na di lanti den conferencia di gente mu eko lutu meluga awe aqui na Amsterdam, junto com nós também nós temos o diretor de nosso TV também, o senhor Tico Voss também junto com nós, e agora nós estamos formando um time que vai cobrir inteiro e evento aqui, fora de começo até o final, que me diz, uau, para não perder nada, mas o nosso TV exclusivamente está trazendo tua imagem diretamente fora de Amsterdam, agora. Imagina que nós acabamos de mirar aqui o Kino Speaker, que vem diretamente fora da Índia, passando também o orador aqui na noite, que nós acabamos de mirar aqui. E se imagina que nós acabamos de mirar aqui, fresco, fresco, mas aqui está tudo o que está acontecendo aqui fora da Amsterdã. Nós estamos cooperando junto com o Team Care da Sra. Carmen Breivelt, a facilitar o nosso serviço de gravação, para nós gravar tudo o que está tomando lugar aqui. A atividade está começando desde aqui, desde o Sol, e está acabando passar de dias dois. E nós temos para reportar para você, de maneira que você não está perdendo nada. Tem coisas tão boas que estão sucedendo, tudo está bom para você registrar. Mas, lamentablemente, na Holanda, boa notícia, não está chegando notícia. Não está notícia para nós. Então, nós temos que ter um grupo que não está criticando a OPI, a Lohtona, a Manan, a Suriname, a Yuna de Terra, a Corsó, a Boneiro, a Saba, a Santa Marta, a Santa Estácia, a qualquer estrangeiro, não está menos preciando, mas agora, nós temos uma pessoa que está ali há muitos anos, nós temos mais também, porque nós temos mais gente também, mais feliz que eles estão, porque está ali há muitos anos aqui na Holanda, só que nós temos que ver que não está marcando pauta e não está quebrando a barreira, criando imagem para nós mesmos, mostrando que nós podemos, e nós podemos fazer coisas bonitas. Nós esperamos que o espetáculo aqui nos supera também, é só um dia, ano passado, o que está pondo, Entre a organização que tem o mapa internacional e nós, de nós TV, sempre contentos de poder registrar o pavo. Quer dizer, queda pendiente. Nós TV é o ano que não é mais forte que nunca, de outro ano com uma equipe muito mais grande. Nós vamos apresentar o inteiro equipe que não traz câmera, não tem agora que não. Carlton Manuel, nós temos, disse que era o Neisa, que também faz sua primeira aparição, de duas aparições, de um evento grande. Nós temos Gilito Riley, Giovanni Jones, Raymond Labat, nós temos Melvin, Rafaela, nós temos uma quantidade de gente. Nós temos também uma pessoa que diz que dá também dois. Nós temos Maybell, Maybell, diz que dá também com sua criatura nova, nós temos uma classe de éxito com o EU novo que vai vir aqui na Ana. Então pronto, é que o nosso nome é também na câmera de nós TV. Que está pendiente, tem com você reportando aqui fora de Passengers Terminal, aqui na Cruz Terminal, na Amsterdã. Het tweede deel van het middagprogramma. En daarin hebben wij voor u drie sprekers, spreeksters. En een uh, ja, paneldiscussie klinkt altijd zo ingewikkeld. Wat is een paneldiscussie? We hebben een uh, terugblik op de dag met hoogtepunten en een korte reflectie door mensen die daar vanuit hun eigen deskundigheid zinnige en uh, toekomstgerichte dingen over kunnen zeggen. Dat is het uh, formele eind van de middag. Maar voordat we zover zijn, vraag ik eerst uw aandacht en warme belangstelling voor een hele bijzondere gast hier vandaag. Haar naam is al even gevallen, Fatima Buto. En ik ga nu verder in het Engels, zodat ze zich ook echt welkom geheten voelt. A very special guest, a writer and poet from Pakistan, 
from a very renowned political family who is uh, deeply concerned with the issue of women and power. And she will reflect on women without power and how often they are forgotten in all strategic planning as it comes to uh, development work, for instance. And she will reflect on women with power and how much good or maybe even how little good they do to world peace. May I have your warm attention for Fatima Bhutto. Good afternoon. Uh, this is very daunting because of the catwalk, so if I start to walk, ignore me. It just means I'm comfortable. Uh, I thought that I would start uh, by thanking you for having me here in Amsterdam. It's a, a great pleasure to have the opportunity to connect and to reflect and to be inspired by so many of the tremendous women here today. And I thought what I would start with is discussing this big complaint we all have. We always hear about the great divides that women face, uh, the divides between women and men in the professional world, in the corporate world, the gaps between female CEOs and male CEOs, between female judges and men judges, between female athletes and male athletes. But we don't really like to talk about the gaps between ourselves and the gaps between women. And so what I'd like to do today is to talk to you a little bit about the embarrassingly global gap between the millions of women out of power and women in power, and then to look a little bit more at how this works and how this plays out in Pakistan, a country that strangely has a connection to the Netherlands, which we'll talk about in a, in a moment or two. I think we start first with, with the good news, which is that wherever it is you look in the world, whether you're looking at Africa or Asia or Latin America, and when you look at women outside of power in these places, you find that women are tremendous forces for positive change. Women raise communities. So we've had tons of studies that show that the best way to develop communities is through women. When you help a woman to earn a salary, to earn a living, and to increase that salary, you're not only impacting the woman herself, but when a woman has an income that increases with time, the welfare of her family automatically shoots up. So when a woman has a job, education in the village will rise because she will send her children to school. As education rises, civic rights rise. Um, as that rises, health rises. As health rises, hygiene rises. As hygiene rises, life expectancy rises. So what you find is that a woman's success outside of power almost always benefits more than just herself. It benefits her family, it benefits her children, and it benefits her community. Um, we also see, outside of power again, that women make more responsible entrepreneurs than men. And you all will know this more than I would, but women are better at repaying loans, for example. Women are medium-term thinkers. And of course, the background to that is that nobody really thinks long-term, but especially not men, you'll be happy to note. Um, men are very committed short-term thinkers. So while men are looking at profit and the profit of today, Women entrepreneurs are looking at how to survive and how to surpass the challenges of the future. So, a woman's way of seeing the world outside of power on a ground level is not only through herself and through her own success. A woman's way of seeing the world is through her future generations, uh, through her children, through her community. And women then have a longer time horizon than men. So it may be true that men influence the present, but women make the future because they're looking towards it. And this is the good news. This is when you look at women outside of power, when you look at small entrepreneurs and small activists and small leaders. But unfortunately, when you go beyond that and you look at women in power, you find quite a different dynamic. And I'm sorry to tell you that it's not as hopeful a dynamic. So maybe we start a little bit just to keep on the global side before we get to Pakistan. 
Um, and we look at Asia. So if you look at the countries of the subcontinent, so, uh, I mean, a percentage that makes up half of Asia and certainly a large chunk of the world's population, you'll find that all the countries of the subcontinent of South Asia have had female heads of state. So India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. These countries, which maybe you may think of as poor countries, as developing countries, places in difficult spots, they've all had women presidents or prime ministers. And they haven't been accidents. These were women who were elected once, they were elected twice, they were elected three times. They continued to return to power. If you look at the five most populated Muslim countries in the world, which again you may not expect, you will find that the five largest Muslim countries have also had women presidents or prime ministers. So that's Turkey, Indonesia, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Now, you know, unfortunately you can't say the same for Europe. You can't say that the five biggest European countries have had female heads of state. And you probably can't even say that the five wealthiest European countries have had female heads of state. So this may look like good news, but unfortunately there are other layers. In all of those cases that I just mentioned, in South Asia, in the Arab world, in the Muslim world, all of those women were the daughters or the mothers or the wives or the nieces of male leaders. More disturbingly than dynasty, you'll find that in most, but not all of those cases, but in most, dynasty was also accompanied by the twin horrors of corruption of these women's presidencies, uh, and if not corruption, and when I say corruption, I mean massive, massive graft, or the violent use of force. So if we look outside of Asia for a second, and we just look at the last hundred years, you'll find that the wars of the 20th century and the occupations of the 20th century have been as easily started by women as by men. So if we just go back in the recent history, you'll find in the 1980s, you had Margaret Thatcher, for example, against the Falklands. And we can be a little more general and say in the 1980s, you had Margaret Thatcher against everyone. Um, you know, Margaret Thatcher against the unions and against the students and against the miners and against the workers. And so you have that. In the 1990s, you had sanctions against Iraq that killed thousands of women and children by depriving them of access to food and medical aid. And Madeleine Albright, the female Secretary of State, was the face of those sanctions and the defender of those sanctions. If we look at this decade, at our current time period, you'll see that America's two official wars, Iraq and Afghanistan, and their you know, mini unofficial wars, Libya, Pakistan, um, are presided over by two female heads of, of foreign policy, Condoleezza Rice and Hillary Clinton. And, to this point, I wonder if, did you all see um, Hillary Clinton reacting to the news that Colonel Gaddafi had been killed? Did any of you see this? For those of you who didn't, when the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, was told that Gaddafi had been killed, and killed, mind you, uh, in cold blood. He was not taken for a trial, he was not arrested, he wasn't brought to The Hague, uh, but he was, from what we saw from all the camera phones and the, the video footage online, he was tortured and possibly sodomized before he was shot in cold blood. When the Secretary of State was told this, her response was simply this, oh wow. We can draw this out even further. We can say that if you remember the Abu Ghraib scandal uh, in the beginning of the Iraq war, of the seven American soldiers tried for abuse and torturing prisoners in Abu Ghraib, three of the seven were women. An apologist said, well, listen, you know, if we had had more women, it wouldn't have happened. There were only three, that's why this was possible. If we had more women, and if we had more women in powerful positions, that violence wouldn't have happened. Well, unfortunately, that's just not true. We have this knee-jerk reaction to say it. But in the case of Abu Ghraib, the head of the prison, and in fact, the head of all of Iraq's, well, central and southern Iraq's prisons, was a woman, General Janet Karpinski. Janice Karpinski, maybe. Anyways, the point being that women do not inspire peace and they do not inspire justice and they do not inspire human rights just by virtue of their gender. Uh, 
it has to be about the quality of leadership, not the gender of the leader. And if we take this now to Pakistan, and I'd like to tell you a little about it, because you now have a similarity with Pakistan, apparently. You see how monstrous this gap is in Pakistan. So a few weeks ago before coming here, when I spoke to Carmen, our wonderful host, um, she told me about a recent poll that found that the Netherlands and Pakistan were placed, they tied together, to place last on a list of countries' treatment of women. Now, when Carmen told me this, I was quite shocked, actually. Um, and the more we spoke and the more I told Carmen about Pakistan, I think the more she was shocked. So, maybe a little bit i tell you about the company you share right now. It's important for us to know, because it is a very surprising and a great shame that our two countries occupy this space in regards to their treatment of women. If you look at women in power in Pakistan, at first glance, our resume would be very impressive. Do you all know a little bit about Pakistan? Or a little bit? No? Not at all? It's not as bad as they say, but I'm only going to tell you bad things for now. So I can tell you nice things later. Um, so Pakistan's resume when it comes to women in power looks very impressive at first glance. The first time we had a woman contest the presidency contest to become the head of state was in the late 1960s. Uh, Fatima Jinnah, who was the sister, like I told you, dynasty is, is sort of everywhere. She was the sister of the nation's founder, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, and she ran for the elections against the country's first military dictator. Uh, now, she lost because you don't tend to win against military dictators. I don't think you have them in the Netherlands, but if you did, you'd know that. And she was the first visible woman on such a high political frame. She was a secular woman, she was unmarried, she had no children, and she was a source of great inspiration. Since then, we've had a two-time woman prime minister. We have women uh, uh, members of parliament. We have women senators. We have women CEOs of, of very powerful companies. Uh, the head of Shell, I believe, in Pakistan was a woman. And we have a woman speaker of the assembly, and we currently have a woman foreign minister. All this sounds really nice, and it sounds very exciting. But what did these women in power do to change the lives of the millions of women outside of power? What did they do to bring positive change to the powerless women in their country? And the answer is absolutely nothing. Now, in 1979, Pakistan's third military dictator, and we have to give them numbers because there are so many of them, General Ziaul Haq launched a series of laws called the Hudud Ordinances. And the Hudud Ordinances are the most violent laws against women in the country. So, again, I don't know if you know about the Hudud Ordinance. If you do, I'm repeating myself. No? So if you'll allow me, I'll tell you a little bit about them. Hmm. Well, the Hudud Ordinances are a series of laws that say that adultery is a crime that should be punished by death. The sin of premarital sexual intercourse is also punishable by death under the Hudud Ordinance. Um, if you steal, then you should have your hands cut off under the Hudud Ordinance. And what this effectively does is that it criminalizes the victims of rape. So. If you are in Pakistan, and this doesn't only apply to Pakistani women, this applies to anyone within the country, and you happen to be raped, and you're married, then you've committed adultery. If you're raped and you're single, then you've just had premarital sex, and in both cases, the punishment is death. The strictest punishment is death. Now, this is barbarous not only because of the scope, but because the constitution of Pakistan, which is not exactly a document that people pay a lot of attention to, but it exists, and the Constitution says very clearly in Article 25 that all citizens are equal in front of the law and all citizens are entitled to equal protection of the law. And it says even further that there is to be no discrimination on the basis of sex alone. But the Hudud laws reject this. So if you are a woman in Pakistan and you would like to prove rape rather than adultery, then you need to go to the police to get permission to have a rape test done. 
If the police do not give you permission, you cannot have a rape test done, and you are an adulterer. If the police are in a good mood that day, and they feel a little generous, and they give you permission, you then have to find a female doctor. If you don't find a female doctor, then you can't have the rape test. The original Hudud law um, included a prescription that said, to prove rape, uh, you have to have four male Muslim witnesses. And these are men you have never met in your life. They've never stolen before, they've never cheated, they've never lied, they pray five times a day, they never miss a prayer, they fast every Ramadan. They are so godly that they can't actually be possibly human beings. And they not only have to witness the rape, but they have to witness it at the exact moment of penetrative rape. Now, this was amended in the law. This, this, only this section that says you need four male witnesses was amended. Not by our female prime minister, not by any of our female MPs, not by any women senators, not by the Speaker of the Assembly, but by the last military dictator who happened to be a man. Um, and, and in fact, many people voted against it. Uh, you all know, maybe you know Imran Khan. You all familiar with Imran Khan, who's a cricketer turned politician? Well, he voted against it. So he thinks we should have four male witnesses to the crime of rape. Not that a woman doesn't need a witness. And it is laws like this that the powerful protect, that the powerful women in Pakistan have defended and have protected, that affect the fates of millions of powerless women. And I'll talk to you just for a few minutes about how, in the real world, this gap plays out. The year after the Hudud laws were passed in Pakistan, um, in 1980, in the entire country, and at the time, this was still a country that had a population of over 100 million people. So immediately after the law, only 70 women, according to Human Rights Watch, were in jail in Pakistan. So a country of 100 million people and plus had only 70 women total in jail. In the 10 years after the Hudud laws were passed, that number jumped to 4,500. The last time anyone checked was in 2004, and that number is now hovering around 7,000 women in 75 jails in Pakistan. In the same year, in 2004, the National Committee on the Status of Women did a report and found that 80% of female prisoners in Pakistan were in jail because of the Hudud laws. Now, because of medical evidence, you can prove that a woman had sex, but you can't prove by medical evidence that a man is a rapist. Uh, there's no blood test, there's no medical exam you can do to, to demonstrate that a man himself is guilty. But there is plenty of medical evidence to prove that a woman is guilty. So you have a prison population of women that has mushroomed in the last 20 years of Pakistan's history. And when women go to jail in Pakistan, they don't go alone. They are not imprisoned by themselves. They are imprisoned usually with their children. So you have a prison population of women and minors, from infants to four-year-olds to six-year-olds to 12-year-olds. And what happens when these children are jailed with their mothers is that they become prisoners too. They cannot leave the jail. They cannot go outside the prison's walls. They live in the four walls of the cell. And everything they require and they need will then be given to them or not given to them by the jails. Uh, I know we have... Uh, some police officers here in the Netherlands, and I had the pleasure of, of, of meeting some just right now. But in Pakistan, the police are a very different force than they might be in Europe or they might be in the Netherlands. And so you have a, a population of children who come into contact with the law, with the police officers, with the wardens. And an independent NGO did a survey in 2006, which was reported by the BBC, and it found that 70% of children that came into contact with police officials were abused in some way. This is a part of the prison story of Pakistan. When you go into the jails and you meet the women in jails, you find that they are there, again, largely on hudud cases, but that they are also incredibly dispossessed of any power. So a woman in a jail in the Sindh province, which is the southern province that I come from, may have already received bail from the courts, and the bail may be as low as 100 euros. Um, if she's able to put down a surety of 100 euros, and it can be as high as 1,000 euros, but it's not much higher than that usually. 
If she can put down that money, then she can leave the jail. But this doesn't happen for two reasons, largely because the women are too poor to put down bail money as low as 100 euros, or because if they are able to put down the money, they have no access to a legal education, to legal empowerment. So they have no way of knowing that if they miss their next court hearing, that money is removed and they go back to jail. So the women stay in jail. And they stay in jail again, not alone, but, but with their children. All of Pakistan's female powers have done nothing to change this. The Hudud laws are very much in place in Pakistan. They are federal law in the country. Um, they can be applied against anyone at any time today. Uh, they were not removed by the women prime minister. They were not removed by the female um, speaker of the assembly. And I don't think I ever heard the foreign minister speak about it once. This is the gulf between women in power and women outside of power. And it's not enough. I think we all, as women, we talk a lot about the importance of women in powerful positions. But it's not enough that women usurp power from men, if they're just going to behave like them anyways. And it's not enough that we have women in high places, if they're not going to behave with a commitment to certain values. Um, if we have women in powerful positions, whether it's in the Netherlands or whether it's in Pakistan, and those women do not carry a commitment to the ethics of nonviolence, to human rights, to progressive political and economic values, then we might even say that there is no difference. Women have to fight on so many different fronts. Um, it's not easy to be a woman anywhere, not in any part of the world. Women fight on the home front, they fight at the workplace, they fight for liberty, they fight for, for movement, for mobility and for freedom. And I suppose if there's one thing that I'd like to reflect upon today or that I'd like to leave you with, it's that gender can never be a substitute for human rights, for the commitment to human rights. Gender can never be a substitute uh, for the commitment to, to, to nonviolence and to justice. Uh, it's simply not enough. It's not enough that we fight these battles and that we win, but we must win them ethically, and we must win them for all other women, not just women at the top of the ladder, um, and not just women with the power to enjoy those successes. So thank you very much. You all look very upset. I'm sorry to have upset you. <laughs> the good news is, is that women fight. And so women continue to battle these bad forces. But I think the message here today has to be that we have to fight together. And we have to make sure that we're on the right side of that fight continually. I don't, think, I don't know if we have time for Q&A or if we're done for the evening. Yes? All done? Unless, uh, I don't know, Carmen? You want to ask? Questions? If, if the audience would like, I don't know, it's up to you. Otherwise, I think I... we have five minutes to do sure. that. Is that sure. okay? Yeah, yeah. great. There's Anyone? A, there was a hand there. Right there. there was. Yeah. <laughs> How was it ever possible that those Haddad laws were adopted by any majority in your country? Well, they weren't adopted by a majority, they were put in place by a military dictator. And that's how they stay. But of course, there have been parliaments since then that have refused to dismantle them. Um, and that's the only way they stay. And if you know the blasphemy laws, I don't know if anyone has, you must have read about these blasphemy laws in Pakistan. They were put in place by the same dictator at the same time. Mm -hmm. There was another question here, I think. Was there or no? Here? Questions? I'm just, I'm Any just questions? People. Yes. I see one raised <laughs> hand over there. Yes, um, I would like to know um, if one of those women would be so brave uh, to actually try to stop this, what would have happened then? What would be the reaction if, suppose, yeah. one did? Yeah, well, I, you must also know about the case of Mukhtar Mai, um, who is famous now across the world. And Mukhtar Mai was an, uh, is an illiterate woman from a very poor village in the Punjab province. And she was gang raped by the most powerful men in her village. And the law says that Mukhtar Mai is, um, is the one to be punished, not her rapists. And, and again, they were very powerful, she's very poor, she can't even read and write. 
And she said, absolutely not. That's ridiculous. She went to the police. She filed a case. She's been fighting in the courts for the last, I mean, nine years just about. Her case reached the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled against her. The Supreme Court of Pakistan said that Mukhtar Mai was just upset. The judge said that she was just upset because none of her rapists offered to marry her. And that if one of them had offered to marry her, she wouldn't have filed the case. But she's still fighting. So she's now appealed this case. And again, you know, if she loses the case, it means she commits adultery. It means she's liable to go to jail. All her rapists are free. But she's still fighting, and she fights really on her own. There's nobody supporting her inside the country. You know, it's women outside who know her and who, and who give her support. Um, and just her bravery. So women fight it, but so far they haven't really fought it with success. One more, two more, <laughs> three more. <laughs> okay. Very short. Four. I don't know. I'm not sure. Let's, let's just start. What can we do? Yeah. Well, um, I, think, I think solidarity is a wonderful thing. And I think when there are women that know about the plight of women, and they help them, they help give them a voice, they help tell their stories. That's an enormous strength. Um, so, and that's one thing that I think people already do, that they connect over the internet, they connect over newspapers, over the media, to tell these stories across the world. That's very helpful. The other thing I would have to say is that Pakistan is a country that's ruled by an incredibly corrupt leadership, you know, and a very violent leadership over the last 30 years. And it survives because of all the money it gets from outside. So it's taken some $22 billion from America just in the last 11 years. $22 billion. It takes money from the European Union, it takes money from the United Nations, and actually it shouldn't have any of that money. Because that money goes to forces that are oppressive, and it goes to forces that put down grassroots activists. It's very hard for people to fight. So Mukhtar Mai, who we just mentioned, when the, her case happened, uh, we had a military dictator in power, who received about $11, $11 billion dollars in military aid. And he went to the UN and he was asked about Mukhtar Mai and he said, there's no such thing as rape in Pakistan. Women just do it to get visas. That's who that money goes to. You know, when, you, when your countries, when Europe gives money to Pakistan, it goes to him, it doesn't go to Mukhtar Mai. And that has to be cut, I think. Thank yeah. you. There was one hand over there. I just go to the other side of the room. Hi. Hi, I was studying transitional justice in South Africa and what we learned there was that people from uh, yeah, their own country, the citizens, uh, can start a successful uh, revolution. So yeah. I don't think the, the, the question is what we can do, yes. but what the people from Pakistan, yes. the women, yes. uh, you know, through social media can do. And Absolutely. my question is, why is there uh, still no revolution? I mean, if, you, 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 yeah. if you're looking at nor Northern African countries, sure. they're all started, you know, like a snowball effect. But sure. What's happening in Pakistan? Uh, well, I think your point about justice is absolutely correct. Um, and unfortunately, we don't see an Arab Spring, or we don't see the beginnings of an Arab Spring happening in Pakistan. I think for several reasons. I think because people are hungry because you have many people who live with incredible food inflation. So the price of bread in Pakistan has risen 900% over the couple of years. So bread used to cost two rupees, now it costs 18 rupees. Um, the economic situation is very bad. People cannot afford to go stand out on the streets. That's one. And, and, and the second, I think, is that they are afraid. When you have a government that kills its own people quite easily, which we've seen it do, when you have a government that allows another country to come in and kill its people, which it's been doing since the war on terror started, people are too frightened to speak. Um, and, and especially when you look at who is the most frightened in these groups, it would be the most dispossessed, the minorities, the poor, the women. There are no safeties in front of the law for women. There are no safeties in front of the law for dissenters. If your voice is inconvenient in Pakistan, they silence you, that's it. But I think you're right. I think, you know, Nelson Mandela said, to go back to South Africa, that, that the road to freedom is long. And so in Pakistan, we have that path too. It will take us time to reach it, but it, it has to come from Pakistan, which it will eventually. I think one last okay. remark or question. Yes. Um, I'm president of the uh, European Professional Women's Network, and we are with a lot of networks here. 
And I know the long way to freedom, the, the, way to, the road to freedom is, is a long way to go. But yeah. what can we do here to help women in your country now? Well, I think one thing that helps tremendously is this people-to-people -people contact. You know, the more that you have contact with people from places like Pakistan, the more you realize um, actually how similar some, some things are and how different other things are. And I don't think it's a question simply of throwing money at a place that makes it better. But it's about partnership and it's about solidarity. You know, it's about supporting women cooperatives. It's about supporting women who are fighting these laws. Um, and the more contact you can have with Pakistan, the more Dutch women can meet Pakistani women, the more Pakistani women can meet Dutch women. I think you create a support system for those women um, that really will sustain them. And I know personally, I know that Mukhtar Mai's story, a lot of Dutch journalists in Pakistan have come specifically to meet her, to tell her story, to raise awareness for her here. They've helped her with her legal fees. They've helped her with security, you know, in that the world is watching. The world knows what's happening. So I think really as, as responsible people, as responsible women or responsible citizens, we have to keep our eyes open for other women. And if you do that, I think it's a great support. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Please hang up and try again.